on World News Tonight. Emotional address. The First Lady of Ukraine appeals to Americans to not forget about the war and addresses her fear for the children. Existential crisis. Scorching temperatures are taking over the United States as President Biden promises aggressive efforts. Tory leadership. Mordaunt is out as Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss is run off to be the next UK Prime Minister. And splish and splash. Dozens of dolphins attract attention as they make a splash off the coast of Chile. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. In the United States, on Capitol Hill, the first time the wife of a foreign leader has delivered remarks to so many gathered lawmakers inside the Capitol. Ukraine's Olena Zelenska making an emotional appeal, not, she said, as the first lady, but instead a daughter and a mother, warning of a worsening humanitarian crisis and pleading for more weaponry as Russia's war on Ukraine rages on. Tonight, an unprecedented and personal plea from the First Lady of Ukraine, Olena Zelenska, warning of a worsening humanitarian crisis. I want to address you not as First Lady, but as a daughter and as a mother. One by one, Zelenska showing images of the youngest victims of the war. Four-year-old Lisa, who she met in December, killed by a Russian missile. Her stroller toppled over in the street. Mama Lisa, Lisa's mother is in serious condition, and for several days, nobody dared to tell her that Lisa has died. Five-year-old Eva, who liked to draw pictures, killed alongside her grandmother. And Sofia from Bucha, who lost her mother and her arm in the violence. How many families like this may still be destroyed by the war? She pleaded for more weapons and specifically air defense systems from the U.S. and what she described as a common cause. We are grateful, really grateful that the United States stands with us in this fight for our shared values of human life and independence. Her speech ending with a rousing standing ovation. The U.S. is promising to deliver four more HIMAR rocket systems to Ukraine in addition to the dozen the U.S. has already sent. Ukrainian officials credit the systems with helping blunt the Russian offensive in eastern Ukraine. But the White House also warning Moscow plans to annex more territory in Ukraine beyond what it already controls. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that Moscow's aim now go beyond the eastern Donbas region. He blamed the West for supplying weapons to Ukraine and reiterated that the purpose of the invasion is to demilitarize the country. Moscow's military goals in Ukraine now go beyond the eastern Donbas region, where Russia initially claimed it wanted to defend breakaway Ukrainian provinces. She meets Mosul. The shift was articulated on Wednesday by Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, who said that one reason Russia might expand what it calls its special operation are the longer-range rockets and artillery the U.S. and NATO allies have been funneling to Ukraine, led by President Volodymyr Zelensky, to beat back the Russian invasion. That means the geographical tasks of the special operation will extend still further from the current line. Because we cannot allow the part of Ukraine that will be controlled by Zelensky or whoever replaces him to contain weapons that will pose a direct threat to our territory and the territory of the republics that have declared independence, those that want to determine their own future. Lavrov's comments are the clearest acknowledgement yet that Russia's objectives have expanded over the five months of war. That's not a surprise to... Uh, to any of us or anybody in Europe or anybody around the globe. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin told reporters on Wednesday Lavrov's statements confirmed what Washington and its allies had suspected were Russian President Vladimir Putin's objectives all along. He uh, has stated a number of times that, you know, this is a limited mm -hmm. operation focused on, uh, on the Donbass. Uh, his actions have proven uh, otherwise. After failing to capture the capital, Kiev, at the outset of the invasion, Russia has shifted to a campaign of devastating bombardments to cement and extend its control of Ukraine's south and east. 
On Wednesday, local officials said a Russian missile killed a 13-year-old boy waiting at a bus stop in the eastern city of Kharkiv. The boy's father clasped his dead son's hand. A day earlier, Russian strikes hit Kramatorsk, a city Western officials believe will become one of the main focuses of Moscow's offensive in eastern Ukraine. Ukraine says Russian forces have intensified long-distance strikes on targets far from the front, killing large numbers of civilians. Moscow says it is hitting military targets. In a visit to Washington, Ukrainian First Lady Olena Zelenska appealed to U.S. lawmakers on Wednesday to provide more arms for her country. I am asking for weapons. Weapons that would not be used to wage war on somebody else's land, but to protect one's home and the right to wake up alive in that home. The European Union drew up targets for curbing gas usage after President Vladimir Putin warned the bloc that Russian supplies sent via Nord Stream 1 were at risk of being reduced further. Europe is racing to find ways to cut gas usage. That after a new warning from Russian President Vladimir Putin. Speaking this week, he said that there could be further cuts to supplies via a key pipeline. The comments come just hours before the Nord Stream 1 route is due to reopen. It's been shut for servicing, and some had feared Russia might delay a restart. Now Reuters sources say the pipeline probably will resume operations as expected on Thursday, but at what capacity looks uncertain. Russia had already cut flows through Nord Stream to 40% of normal levels before the stoppage. The disruptions have hampered European efforts to refill gas storage facilities before the winter. That raises the risks of shortages and rationing. Now the EU has set a target for cutting gas consumption in the bloc. It wants member states to reduce usage by 15% between August and March compared with previous years. The target could be made binding in an emergency if the EU declares a serious gas shortage. It's hoped the proposals could be approved within days, though Poland and some other states aren't keen. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen says Europe has to act. Overall, the flow of Russian gas is now less than one-third to what it used to be, for example, at the same time last year. Russia is blackmailing us. Russia is using energy as a weapon. And therefore, in any event, whether it's a partial major cutoff of Russian gas or total cutoff of Russian gas, Europe needs to be ready. Putin denies such charges, saying Russia and energy giant Gazprom are reliable partners. He says any shortfall in supplies is due to problems with pipeline equipment. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson received a round of applause from the members of his Conservative Party after he finished addressing Parliament in his last appearance during Prime Minister's questions. The two candidates in the Conservative leadership race are setting out their pictures to the party members who will choose Boris Johnson's successor. Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss topped the final ballot of MPs. Sunak said that he would introduce a set of reforms as radical as the ones Margaret Thatcher drove through the 1980s. Trust promised tax cutting, enterprise boosting, business friendly conservative policy. The two finalists will now set out their stalls at 12 Hustling to be held around the UK. The first will take place in Leeds on the 28th of July, while the last will be in London on the 31st of August. Over in the United States, President Joe Biden said that climate change is an emergency but stopped short for a formal declaration, announcing a modest package of executive actions and promising more aggressive efforts. As a scorching heat wave batters Europe and the United States, U.S. President Joe Biden unveiled new executive steps to address climate change in a visit to Massachusetts on Wednesday. It is literally not figuratively a clear and present danger. The health of our citizens and our communities is literally at stake. But Biden stopped short of declaring a federal emergency, a move many Democrats have urged. Instead, Biden announced a modest package of executive actions, but promised more aggressive efforts. Some 100 million Americans from New York City to Las Vegas will be under heat warnings this week. Climate change is literally an existential threat to our nation and to the world. 
The announcements included new funding for cooling centers and a push for new offshore wind projects in the oil-rich Gulf of Mexico. Today, we began the process to develop wind power in the Gulf of Mexico as well for the first time. A real opportunity to power millions of additional homes from wind. The Federal Emergency Management Agency will also provide $2.3 billion in funding to help states build cooling centers and to tackle other aspects of climate change. New funding could expand flood control, shore up utilities, retrofit buildings and help low-income families pay for heating and cooling costs. But those actions fall short of demands by Democratic lawmakers and environmental activists who want Biden to formally declare a climate emergency, which would enable the use of the Defense Production Act to ramp up production of a wide range of renewable energy products and systems. Biden is under increasing pressure after conservative Democratic Senator Joe Manchin said last week he was not ready to support key climate provisions in Congress, a critical loss in the evenly divided Senate. Biden said in the coming days he'll be announcing more executive actions to combat climate change. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, North Korea's nuclear ambitions appear to have taken on a heightened sense of urgency amongst relevant authorities in the U.S. In fact, a meeting on the matter was held in the U.S. Strategic Command for the first time. A report by the Wall Street Journal on Wednesday shed light on a meeting held at the U.S. Strategic Command in Omaha, Nebraska. The meeting was attended by intelligence and military officials and experts on May 23rd and 24th. It was hosted by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, which oversees all U.S. intelligence agencies, and the Defense Intelligence Agency, which oversees all military-related intelligence. The report noted that this was the first time that a discussion on the North Korean nuclear issue has been held at the Strategic Command, evidence that the regime's nuclear threats are being taken more seriously. Previously, only Russian and Chinese nuclear issues were discussed at the Strategic Command. During the two-day forum, officials took note of North Korea's advancing nuclear capabilities, such as miniaturizing its nuclear warheads. Others raised concerns that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un could use such technology to gain concessions from the U.S. and South Korea. Another possibility? The actual use of nuclear weapons if Kim feels both Seoul and Washington are trying to get rid of him. One of the attendees, professor at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies, Jeffrey Lewis, stressed that Washington should change its strategy against North Korea. He says with the current state of North Korea's nuclear capabilities, the U.S. should now focus on deterring North Korea from further production of nuclear weapons instead of aiming for denuclearization. One senior military official also insisted that there is zero chance that North Korea will give up its nuclear weapons. A seventh nuclear test seems to be on the horizon, and Pyongyang is showing no signs of easing up on its nuclear weapons production. In Italy, a year and a half after he was appointed as Italy's unelected head of unity government, Mario Draghi has resigned as prime minister. He told President Sergio Mattarella that he was standing down after three parties of his government refused to back him in the confidence vote in the night before. The president asked him to remain as caretaker leader and early elections are expected this autumn. He first tendered his resignation a week ago when one of the parties in his broad-based government refused to back his economic package, prompting a political crisis. President Mattarella asked him to stay in the post as he told the upper house of the parliament he would continue if the political parties were ready to back a strong cohesive government with a new pack of trust. For several hours, Italians waited with battered breath before three of the parties decided they would not back him in a vote of confidence. President Mattarella said his government would remain in office to handle current affairs but did not say exactly what would happen next. Elections were due to take place in the first half of 2023 but will most likely be brought forward to October. South African inflation surged to a 13-year high in June, moving further away from the central bank's target the day before an interest rate announcement. South Africa's headline consumer inflation hit a 13-year high in June. Data from Statistics South Africa showed on Wednesday. 
In annual terms, inflation was 7.4%. The pickup in inflation in Africa's most advanced economy comes the day before the South African Reserve Bank is due to announce an interest rate decision. Analysts expect a further 50 basis point rise in the repo rate, the rate at which commercial banks borrow from the central bank. That would mark the fifth increase in a row. June headline inflation was the highest since May 2009, during the global financial crisis. Statistics SA figures showed food and fuel prices continue to be major drivers of price pressure. They have soared globally due to the war in Ukraine. Fuel prices were up 45.3% in June, the largest annual increase since the agency's Consumer Price Index series began in 2009. Prices of food and non-alcoholic beverages rose 8.6%, the highest annual rate since March 2017, when the country was recovering from severe drought. Kenyans will be heading back to the polls to vote for their next president and leaders, and the economy appears to be taking center stage. Thousands of Kenyans have been taken to the streets calling for a boycott of the elections because of the high cost of living. An international food crisis and a drought which has cut down food supplies. This summer, Kenyans have seen extreme difficulties pile up. These protesters are not just angry, they're terrified of not being able to eat as food prices jump. They call their movement the hunger revolution and urge immediate measures to stop inflation. By we, this grandmother is also referring to her 12 grandchildren, who she now struggles to feed. She can only afford one meal per day. Like a number of other Kenyans, she is not planning to vote in August. Other Kenyans also plan to boycott the election, hoping to get candidates' attention. Uh, the average Kenyan is very, very politically aware, very politically engaged, uh, and we achieve high voter turnouts with almost every general election. Uh, so when you have a voter registration process in which uh, the, t the, the IABC falls below its target, um, that's, that's new, that's uh, a bit of a concern, to be honest. Candidates have addressed voters' concerns with pledges to fight inflation and get them loans. But they haven't outlined how they plan to finance these crucial measures. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. South Korea and Saudi Arabia celebrated their 60th anniversary of friendship and pledged to pursue new opportunities. Foreign Minister Park Jin met with visiting Prince Faisal bin Farhan Al Saud. The funeral for Ivana Trump, socialite and the first wife of former US President Donald Trump was held at St. Vincent Ferrer Church in New York. She died at 73 as a result of an accident after suffering blunt force trauma injuries in her torso. Torrential rain fell across Senegal, causing floods in the capital Dhaka and bringing down a section of one of the main highways into the city. Microsoft said that the functionality of its team software is beginning to recover after an outage, but the firm did not disclose details on how many users were affected. A wild storm system moving across New Zealand is bringing swirling winds, surging waves and heavy rains to the capital Wellington and causing flooding in Christchurch. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you missed watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight with a look at dozens of dolphins spotted making a splash of the coast in Chile. Stay safe and have a good night.